guide and caregiver's guide to understanding both of these things. So um, as I mentioned, just if you wouldn't mind keeping yourself muted during the presentation, it I am it's gonna take me about 45 to 50 minutes to get through it. Um, and we will stop the live stream at the end of the presentation and have, just have time for questions and discussions. So welcome. And I am your speaker. My name is Erica Narducci. I am a licensed clinical social worker and the program director here at Cancer Support Community Delaware. And I am a cancer survivor, which led me to the work I do today. And we are going to talk a little bit about the importance of self-care during survivorship. So I showed you a few pictures of what self-care looks like to me. Um, I started running shortly after my treatment and this May finished, um, ran the Broad Street Run, which is 10 miles with my husband on a very rainy morning. Uh, also, uh, we have a knitting group here and I absolutely love knitting. I do it almost every day. Um, and it's definitely a big piece of my self-care. So that middle picture was me um, at a, on a field trip with our knitting group, super happy because I found some awesome yarn. And then playing golf is another piece of my self-care. And that is a picture there of me with my favorite golf partner, which is my mom. So we are Cancer Support Community Delaware, part of a national organization operating locally here in Delaware in Wilmington, Dover, Rehoboth Beach, and Middletown. We offer support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, and educational session, sessions such as this one. Um, we offer group health coaching and financial support. And we are part of a national organization who helped put these wonderful slides together today. And they were medically reviewed by Dr. Knettel and he gave him the thumbs up. So here we go. Um, I wanted to start with a little activity. Um, I did mention if you wanna grab a pen um, and paper, this would be a good time to jot some things down. If not, you can just kind of think along with us in your mind, but think about some uh, feelings you've had in the past month, feelings and emotions. So today's July 15th. So think back about a month that would have been mid-June. School was just getting out. Summer was just getting rolling. The temperature was a lot cooler than we're having these last weeks. What kind of emotions from that time till now were you experiencing? Just kind of think about that and maybe jot down a few words. Um, that come to mind. So recognizing the emotions we feel is the first step to understanding our mental health. So that's why I'm asking you to kind of start by thinking about these things. So if you're still writing that down or thinking about it, um, continue to do so. Our agenda today is gonna to be uh, to cover a lot of things in a short amount of time. So we're gonna talk about what is mental health? Why does it matter? Uh, what are emotions or feelings? We're going to talk about some definitions to help us describe those things. Um, and then we're going to talk about your mental health and cancer at different points along the cancer journey at the time of diagnosis, um, through treatment. And then we'll talk a little bit about survivorship um, and our mental health. And then we'll talk to our caregivers that are with us today. And um, we'll end just by talking about some ongoing self-care. So jumping right in, what is mental health and why does it matter? Why are we here talking about this topic today? So mental health is a combination of physiological, emotional, and social well-being. So physiological is how we think, emotional is how we feel, and social is how we connect to others. So all of those are important pieces of our mental health. It is completely normal to experience ebbs and flows across time, you know, maybe even change day to day. You may have noticed a certain event, either a sudden one or one that lasts a long time can cause you to feel certain emotions. These emotional responses influence your overall mental health. So why does it matter? Our mental health is as equally important as our physical health. And you're gonna hear me say that several times this afternoon. Just as we do our best to be physically healthy, it is important to also aim to be mentally healthy. Your mental health impacts your mood and can influence your motivation to participate in activity. So your mental health is just as important as your physical health. 
because it impacts your overall wellness and quality of life. So some factors or examples that might affect your mental health are things like responsibilities, whether it's school, work, or family, difficult conversations or situations that come up, serious illnesses like cancer, financial concerns can really affect us. Maybe you've moved recently. It can be across the country, across the couple states away. Maybe it's just across the street, but moving away from our community can really affect us. Also the death of a um, family member or a friend. Uh, at Cancer Support Community Delaware, we've experienced several deaths just in this calendar year alone. And that's been very challenging, not just for those of you who attend our programs, but for for us and myself as um, the staff that work here as well. And I am gonna talk a little bit more about this a little bit later. So we're gonna take a poll. If I can get my technology to work, I'm super excited about this. It's the first time I've ever tried it. So the question I am sending out to you, um, it should come up on your screen and it's asking you, do you feel it is difficult to talk about mental health? Um, so you can let me know, yes, no, only if it's somebody else, maybe not me. Great, so it looks like most of you have answered. So I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna show you the results. Um, so we're pretty equally divided. Um, with a little bit more of you saying, yes, this is really hard to talk about. Um, I'm sure those of you have said, no, you've, uh, there might've been a time when it was difficult for you to talk about, but you know the importance of talking about it or else you wouldn't be here today listening to our program. I'm glad nobody said it was only easy to talk about for somebody else. So thank you for doing doing that with me. So one of the reasons it's really difficult to talk about is because there's a lot of stigma around mental health. And that comes because societies, cultures place um, health, mental health and seeking support uh, in kind of a negative light. Uh, but really help starts just by talking to a friend or a loved one. Uh, it can be something difficult to describe or understand, right? Because it's not like physical health where we can say, my arm hurts here and I have a big bruise, right? It's something inside of us that, that can be harder to explain. Um, but you should not feel ashamed to talk about it or to seek help. So stigma can look like this, a sign of weakness, that you're a lesser person, not a real problem um, or not that bad. I hear this one a lot, um, just choose to be happy. If you just choose to be happy, you'll be fine. Um, you have a great life. You don't have a reason to struggle. Or maybe uh, I'm not gonna talk to a stranger about my problems. So you may have heard or experienced someone describe mental health in these ways. Hearing someone say these words is difficult and it can impact how you support your own health. We should all try not to align with the stigma that exists around mental health. Normalizing mental health means to recognize its value for your overall health. Remember, our mental health is as important as our physical health um, and the need we have for everyone to get support and resources for their mental health. We can all understand the importance of maintaining maybe a healthy weight um, for the benefit of a physical, for our physical health. So our mental health should be the same. Taking steps for our benefit should be as equally important. So let's talk about it. People can sometimes mask how they're truly feeling, which can make it difficult to understand how prevalent mental health concerns can be. Feeling alone is common if people do not talk openly about their mental health and why it matters. Uh, talking about it is the first step to finding support and feeling satisfied in your health. So what are emotions or feelings? It can include a lot of moving parts. So we're going to talk about some of the words um, within mental health. It's kind of a first step for us in understanding and then maybe being able to describe how your your own how you're feeling yourself. 
everyone experiences some degree of emotional ups and downs. This is normal. There are different types of treatment and support options that can help you. We're going to get into some of those in a little bit. Regardless of how these feelings exist in your life, it is important to seek help when they concern you or you notice that they're impacting your quality of life. So let's define some of these words. The first one um, is anxiety. Uh, we hear this a lot, I'm very anxious. I have a lot of anxiety, right? So we define that as a feeling of uneasiness, of worry, of fear. Um, it usually occurs because of stress. Often it's because we it's the fear of the unknown, of something happening, May, whether the thing is actually gonna happen or not, we can feel fearful of that. Um, and anxiety can have very physical sensations like being tense or your heart is racing. Um, you or someone you know may have experienced uh, going to the emergency room thinking they were having a heart attack when really um, they got there and the, the doctor said you're actually just having an anxiety attack. So it can feel very much like a, a cardiac event. So that's anxiety. Grief is another emotion that's very common. And grief is defined as an emotional response to loss. So the loss can be actually of a person. It can be a loss of health. It can be a feeling of a loss of control. So stress is another emotion that we um, feel. And it's defined as a state of feeling overwhelmed. And that can be physically, mentally, or emotionally. And it can be because of a certain event. It be can be because of a trauma or it can be um, because of an illness. You may not always think of your emotions as maybe being anxiety, grief, or stress. Maybe it's a combination of these, like a cocktail of a little bit of each, um, or you might really feel like, oh, I'm really fit in that one category. Um, but these are words we can use to explain the emotions um, of our mental health. When discussing mental health, it's important to also talk about depression and how to recognize it. It's not unusual to have feelings of depression or anxiety after getting a cancer diagnosis or throughout the journey. Additionally, it's not uncommon to feel a level of stigma around depression. But actually 27% of cancer patients experience depression. So it's important to recognize the signs and there is no shame and asking for help. So the signs of depression um, are loss of pleasure and interest in activities that you usually enjoy, a change in our eating or sleeping habits, and feelings of worthlessness or hopelessness. Um, and these often kind of feed on each other. Um, but if you have experienced these feelings for at least two weeks, consider um, seeking help. You can discuss it with your medical team. We're going to talk a little bit about what medical team, what that means. Um, you can ask me because I can help you connect with some resources. Maybe you talked to a therapist in the past. So now might be a good time to schedule another appointment with them or talk to them about uh, maybe who they can suggest that can support you during this time. If you or someone you know is showing any of these signs, consider what your next best step might be. There are treatment and support options available, available to help you through this. There are mental illnesses other than depression and anxiety disorders. If you feel your daily quality of life is impacted because of your mental health and the emotions you're feeling really overwhelmed by, consider speaking to a medical or mental health professional because mental illness can affect our mood, our thoughts, our feelings, and our interactions with others. I also want to touch a little bit on suicidality. So suicidality is the risk of suicide. Uh, it's usually indicated by what we call um, suicidal ideation, uh, which is when someone is thinking about or planning, having intentions to act on suicidal thoughts. So some of the signs we can be aware of, uh, not only in ourselves, but maybe others around us, would be withdrawal from loved ones and community, mood swings, thoughts of self-harm or impulsive behavior. Sometimes a person doesn't show any of these signs, uh, but when we do see them, it is a red flag that we need to um, you know, consider an intervention. A cancer diagnosis and the resulting treatments can be difficult to manage and on top of other demands in your life as well. 
regardless of how you are feeling, help is always available. So if you or someone you know is experiencing thoughts of taking their own life at any time, you can call the number I have here. These helplines are open 24 seven. So um, at the end of the presentation, I do have a slide with this and some other resources on it, and you will get an email um, with those resources that you can print out as well. So let's shift to talk now a little more about you, your mental health through the cancer journey. So we're going to start with another little activity. Um, I would like you to write down at the time of diagnosis, whether it was you or your loved one, what were the emotions you experienced? Uh, if you remember, if it wasn't that long ago, it might be fresh in your mind. But um, think of some of those words we were just defining, anxiety, grief, and stress, or those part of your words um, of how you felt when you were diagnosed. So when I was first diagnosed, I described to many of my friends and family that I felt like I was on this merry-go-round that was, I was on the horse going up and down and the, the uh, merry-go-round was going around. It seemed to be going a little faster than it should be, but yet the world around me was just going on along um, it, with their own business, not like it was normal. And I was missing it because I was stuck on this merry-go-round. So I recognized later what I was describing is um, I was very stressed and I was definitely experiencing some anxiety around that time. In 2022, a survey showed that um, of cancer patients, 74% were worried about the future, 60% felt sad or depressed, and 64% felt nervous or afraid at the time they were diagnosed. And we're going to see in a little bit that um, for caregivers, these numbers are the uh, very similar. These are pretty high. So our mental health at diagnosis, it is very normal. As we can see by these statistics, people are feeling a lot of emotions at the time of diagnosis. Um, receiving this diagnosis is very difficult. And you might feel like these emotions are hard to handle. But your care team and your loved ones and family um, are going to ask how you're feeling. So it's important to trust them, to be honest with them, and to share about your emotions surrounding the diagnosis and how you're feeling about what's ahead. So we're going to talk about each one of these emotions and kind of what they look like at diagnosis. There could be a lot of fear and worry. You could be fearful about the unknown, about the impact on job and finances and family. Uh, you may be feeling worried about your own health or um, your appearance and changes that are coming. Um, you could be very fearful about losing your independence. At diagnosis, you might be very anxious about um, just how am I going to manage treatment and all my other responsibilities? What is the future going to look like for me? What am I going to tell my friends and my children and my spouse? You can also experience sadness and a loss of hope. Um, there might be a struggle with kind of the why question, why is this happening um, or how? And there can be sadness about um, maybe not overcoming the diagnosis, maybe concerns about dying. There's also um, that feeling with a loss of control of your life and what is happening. And at diagnosis, as long as, as well as other times along the cancer um, continuum, you can be very uncertain about next steps. Um, we can be afraid about how your life may change. You can be afraid about um, treatment or surgery side effects. Um, there's a lot of unknowns that are coming right after diagnosis. Also, you can be uncertain about how am I going to overcome this illness? So I wanted to take a minute here just to mention um, distress screenings. Um, a distress screening is a type of questionnaire um, that you may be asked to complete either, you know, often when you go to your primary doctor or your oncologist, sometimes it's every time you come in. We um, offer a distress screening every time you fill out our participant information sheet when you come as a new participant, also annually when you fill it out again. Distress screeners are put together by really intelligent people um, and they ask the right kind of questions that kind of pinpoint where you're feeling distress. And um, so it can help your responses, help them to help you. 
Um, so I just as much as you roll my eyes when I think, oh, I have to fill out another thing, um, but it can be a really useful tool. Um, and I encourage you to uh, utilize it well and fill it out um, as accurately as possible so your care team can better serve and support you. Also, speaking openly about previous mental health concerns before diagnosis is important. Um, if you've struggled with your mental health, maybe you've um, been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or even depression, um, if you've met with a therapist or had a different diagnosis before um, cancer, share that with your care team because then they can better provide you with the support you need. So I mentioned care team several times. So who do I talk to? What is my care team? What does that mean? So um, you will have your oncologist uh, and that might be a med medical oncologist who is overseeing you for systemic treatment like chemo or um, immunotherapy. Um, you may have a radiation oncologist who is overseeing your radiation treatments. Each of those office have, offices will have nurse practitioners uh, who you might see interchangeably with your oncologist. Um, and nurses. They're all great um, first steps for resources. Uh, you may have a patient or nurse navigator who um, takes care of scheduling appointments. They may even be the person that um, answers questions that when you have them along the way. And um, so they also can be a great resource um, for, for, you know, getting you to the right person you might need on your care team. So just additional members that might be on your care team, uh, the oncology offices may have a licensed social worker there and they can provide support uh, kind of in the short term um, by meeting with them, also providing lots of resources. Uh, you may have a licensed therapist or psychologist that can give kind of more of a long-term uh, therapy, either individually or with a group. And uh, it's important to find one specializing in care for cancer patients. So Helen Graham uh, Cancer Center is a good example. They have the psychosocial oncology department where they have um, a wonderful team of psychologists and therapists that um, support the patients, not only patients that come to Helen Graham, but others in the area as well. So your team may also include a psychiatrist, uh, they can diagnose mental illnesses. They can also help you if you're using medication. Um, they can prescribe it and also help follow you and make sure you're getting the right kind of medication for what you need. You can also have a chaplain on your care team, um, whether it's a chaplain through the cancer center where you go. Maybe it's your own uh, priest or rabbi or pastor where you go for spiritual services. They can also be an important person to talk to um, and help you to manage your care. Uh, and then, of course, community supports like us, Cancer Support Community Delaware and, and other nonprofits or centers that you use for support. So let's talk now a little bit about during treatment um, and your mental health. With any treatment you're given for cancer, uh, make sure to always inform your care team when you experience new changes in your emotions or feelings related to mental health, um, because your emotions can change as things get rolling now. Um, one example is that um, suddenly you're a little more agitated than you were about things at home, and that didn't happen before. So that's something maybe to talk to your care team about. It could be a side effect of a medication. It could just be an indication that um, you're feeling real, some anxiety about your treatment and diagnosis. Uh, many cancer treatments cause side effects that impact your mental, physical, and or functional health. And your care team can only best care for you when they're aware of any changes, side effects, or other concerns that you might have. Also, don't forget to mention life events outside of cancer treatment because life is still going on um, and things still happen in our um, personal lives as well as our treatment lives. So those are important things to discuss with your care team and, and realize that we might need some support in going through. So what are the options for me as I'm going through treatment for support? So there's always one-on-one -on -one therapy. That would be with a licensed therapist. It could be a psychologist, a social worker, uh, or other counselor. Usually sessions are 60 minutes. Um, and sometimes people just need one, two, or, or three sessions to really just kind of help calm their mind about what they're going through. But you may want to meet with them weekly or monthly through your entire treatment journey and beyond. Uh, and these can be done in person or virtually. 
there's group therapy and there's support groups. Um, both are can be led by um, therapists or uh, other mental health professionals. And a group therapy in, is done more um, where with um, their psychosocial education as part of the group and maybe some some teaching from the therapist, more therapist led. What we offer here at Cancer Support Community are support groups where it's more of a peer support with others in the group who are in a similar situation like you. Uh, although we our groups are always monitored or led by a mental health professional um, to help give you the support you need as well. Uh, some organizations offer peer-to-peer -peer men mentorship where they can pair you with someone who has a similar diagnosis or has been through a similar event, and they can be great for giving um, advice and kind of where you've already been. And I try to do this within our community as much as possible, and people request it. Um, there are lots of other community resources. I mentioned some earlier, like church, um, maybe a senior center that you attend. Of course, places like us, um, Cancer Support Community Delaware uh, and others around. And then palliative care can also provide um, support. If you have, have a more advanced cancer diagnosis, this may be suggested. And I'm gonna talk a little more about that later. So medication might be uh, something that you need to consider. Um, even if you weren't someone who took medication for mental health reasons before, uh, you should not be ashamed or um, shy away from this. There, can, there is a lot of stigma around medication as well, but sometimes this can be the best thing we can do for ourselves and those around us. It doesn't have to be forever, and it might not even be something you need every day, um, but a psychologist or licensed therapist can maybe help determine with you that that might, if that might be appropriate. And then a psychiatrist can help um, prescribe it for you. Um, so it could, like I said, anything from where maybe you need to be on something daily. Maybe it's just something that, okay, on the days when you're feeling a little extra anxious, um, here's something to help you through that. So be sure that your oncology uh, care team knows if you're taking anything to make sure there's not any interactions between what you're already taking or treatments you're going to be receiving. So let's move on now to talk a little bit more about survivorship. So survivorship is the point you may reach when all active treatment has been completed. You may still be prescribed medications that are helping with long-term management of cancer or the side effects that you've experienced because of primary treatment, um, but we, we still would consider this um, point when you're done with active treatments as survivorship. So there are different emotions during this time. So these emotions are maybe some relief that this is finally over um, and some optimism, but maybe only like cautiously op optimistic, right? Um, there can be a lot of fear or anxiety that the cancer may come back. Uh, if you are living with cancer, uh, you, you may be concerned and thinking about when is it going to come back? Is it going to come back? And there can still be a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty about what the future holds. So an emotion that we got to make up a new word for is something we called anxiety. Uh, this is a type of anxiety that typically occurs um, at the time of having a test or scan, or maybe at the time of receiving um, the test or imaging results. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can be at higher levels, even after treatment has ended. Uh, and the reason that may happen is because you're not having as many frequent visits with your healthcare team. So the um, events can can also induce a similar kind of anxiety like this, maybe an anniversary related to your cancer experience. Like this is the fifth anniversary of the time I heard the words, I have cancer, and that can make you a little nervous. Um, annual checkups with your healthcare team can also cause a little bit of this um, anxiety. So some tips on, on managing um, scan anxiety include um, just allow yourself to experience these emotions of fear and anxiety and recognize this is a normal thing to experience because of what I'm going through and talk to others about it and mention it. Sometimes just saying, I'm going to a scan today and I'm a little nervous about it is enough to kind of help us recognize um, I'm having these emotions. Maybe be careful not to look at information online too much. 
as in don't become Dr. Google, like what if this, what if that, um, that can lead us down a dark hole that maybe feeds the anxiety instead of um, helping us not get as worked up. Um, patient portals allow us to see all of our test results and all sorts of information. So maybe understand what um, is appropriate for you. Maybe you wanna wait to look at your results in the portal portal till you're with the doctor and able to understand it together. Um, looking ahead of time, if it's going to cause anxiety for you until you know, um, can understand what it actually means, then wait till you're with the, your doctor. Your care team is still a wonderful re resource, even after you've completed treatment, to discuss your emotions with, even through survivorship. So continue caring for yourself during um, survivorship by participating in activities you enjoy, engage in healthy habits and activities, um, whether it's maybe physical activities, so important to eat a healthy diet, um, have good sleep habits. And these things at first, you know, it's, it's hard. We're in a transition time um, coming out of treatment. So it might, might be difficult taking that first step, but the more we work on these um, and the more we increase them, it increases our mood and it can increase our mental health. It is important to be intentional about caring for yourself all along the cancer continuum, even after completing your main or active treatments. The transition back to life after treatment could bring on new challenges that you may not have thought about. Similar to um, receiving support when you were receiving a cancer diagnosis, is it is a, as important to receive the support you need at this stage as well. It is not uncommon for um, patients to call me and say, you know, I finished treatment. Am I still eligible to come to your support programs? And I always say, absolutely, yes. Now that your focus isn't on treatment, sometimes it can be very overwhelming. This is just as critical of a time for support in your cancer journey. So you're juggling a lot of things, kind of getting back to a normal life um, of adjustments. So your uh, oncology care team at this point may give you something called a survivorship care plan. Uh, once you have reached survivorship, this plan will detail the history of your treatment and then future appointments um, and kind of what the plan is. You can maybe see them every three months for a certain amount of time, every six months, every year when you reach a certain point and so on. It can also outline your other providers, uh, the other specialists that you have, including your primary care physician. So your primary care physician is going to be a very important resource going forward. Um, so if you don't have a primary care provider, um, work with your oncologist to maybe find one and see who they can suggest. Your um, primary care physician will be an important person for making sure you're following up with screenings, whether it's skin checks, colonoscopies, whatever other tests you may need. So this was one of my biggest struggles coming into survivorship. My um, primary care provider had retired and I had been using my oncologist as my primary care doctor, but that it was not what she was going to be for me anymore. So it was really important to get established with someone um, as I was getting back to my new normal. So being told that your cancer diagnosis has come back, which we call a reoccurrence, that your current diagnosis has progressed, which we call relapse, or that your cancer has spread or is incurable, which we call metastatic, is very difficult to hear. Living with an advanced cancer can be difficult in unique ways. It's normal to experience emotions such as fear, defeat, or sadness. And all those emotions and worries you feel are very valid and worthy of support. So continue to stay aware and supportive of your mental health. Um, and there are still supports available to you. And there might be some, uh, your, your care team may know of some things available that are unique to your diagnosis. And this is the point maybe where they will suggest a palliative care specialist. So usually we think of a palliative care doctor as the person who's um, gonna help me cope with my pain. And yes, that's a big part of what a palliative care um, team does, um, but it is a team and the team will include a, a doctor, could be a nurse practitioner, nurses, social workers, and others. Um, so they assist with supporting you and your um, 
caregiver, your family, with appointments for tests, managing other medications, making sure you are comfortable and not in pain. Maybe you need to get medical equipment. Um, they can talk to you about your wishes for, for care and treatment going forward into this next chapter of um, what's happening. So they can be super helpful and great resources at this time. So it's important to just stay connected with your loved ones and your care team, um, even through this part of, of a cancer journey about how you are feeling. So as I mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit more about grief when we experience a loss in a cancer family. So here um, in our programs and or maybe in the waiting room at your cancer center, you have the blessing of meeting other cancer patients, people going through the same thing as you. Um, or if you're a caregiver, kind of caring for these um, wonderful individuals that you love that are going through this cancer journey. Um, and we make new friends that we not, wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and sometimes they pass away. And when they die, it is very taxing to our own mental health. And you may experience things such as a heightened anxiety with your own um, journey. You may consider your own death and re-examine your own mortality. You may experience something called survivor's guilt and feel um, guilty because you're still alive when they have passed away. All these feelings and emotions of sadness and grief are very normal at this time. You might even feel um, almost like a chemo brain type symptoms where you kind of feel a foggy brain. You might be overwhelmed or tired and it kind of hits you all at once. Uh, these are all very normal to experience as we're processing um, these emotions. Be kind to yourself and remember the self-care things that have worked for you so far. Um, and engage in some of those. It can be helpful sometimes to find a way to commemorate the person that you've lost, whether um, you just do something personally and privately, or maybe with a group with which you, um, you knew the individual. So here at Cancer Support Community Delaware, we had um, we often had a we had an annual program where we would have a memorial for those who had passed away during the year. Um, and we have not done that since before the pandemic. Um, but we are working and planning on bringing that back. So stay tuned for more information and news about probably late September. We are going to hold um, a memorial and to help remember and um, have um, hold a moment and space for those wonderful people that we met here um, that we've lost in these last years. So I wanna talk a little bit now to our caregivers Caregiving is difficult, no matter um, the reason or the health condition that might be involved. As a caregiver, you're not alone. Um, it, a survey showed that 68% were, um, percent were worried about the future, 59% felt nervous or afraid, and 59% felt sad or depressed. Those are pretty high um, for, the, for our caregivers. And if you remember the same um, statistic for newly diagnosed patients, these numbers were almost as high. So our caregivers are on the cancer journey with us as well and feeling the same kind of emotions and burden. You may feel burnt out or distressed as a caregiver since you are having to balance someone else's health as well as your own. As a caregiver, take time to care for yourself and your needs. It is very difficult to optimally care for a loved one when your own health and your own energy are not at their highest potential. So my slide here says it's difficult to pour from an empty cup. I always love the example um, of when you're on the airplane and the, the stewardess says, now if we have a loss of cabin pressure, the oxygen masks are gonna fall, but put your own on first and then help the person next to you that might need help. So caregiving is much like that. We need to make sure our own oxygen masks are secure so we can really help those beside us um, with theirs as well. So some common challenges for our caregivers are feeling stressed uh, about how their life is gonna change while also fearing, feeling fearful or worried about their loved one. 
Um, there's a lot of things our caregivers have to balance. It could be other children and their finances or job um, and just all their other responsibilities that they need to balance. So anger, worry, sadness, they're all emotions you may feel as a caregiver. They are valid and important to be recognized and important for you to address and to talk about. So use what's available to you. The better you care for yourself, the better you will be able to care for your loved one. Some support options that exist for you uh, as a caregiver are support groups. And we have support groups here for our caregivers um, separately from our patients. So you can meet with others who are going through um, the same journey you are and talk with them. You can also do one-on-one -on -one therapy. Um, you can engage in any of the other programs we have here as well to support your, your mental health. Um, we understand you want to do anything and everything you can for your loved ones, uh, but that can feel really overwhelming. So consider asking for help and that can add balance between all your responsibilities. Someone else could maybe take care of tasks you would normally do, such as picking up the groceries or getting, um, giving rides. Maybe someone could take uh, your loved one to an appointment instead of you. Maybe you could ask them to watch your pets or your kids for a period of time to give you a break. Because for you, caregivers, your mental health is just as important as your physical health. So we're going to start wrapping it up today by talking about ongoing self-care. Um, the next, my next few slides are going to provide some things you can do on your own that benefit your ongoing mental health and thus your overall health and energy. So what can I do now? Regardless of where you live or where you get care, there are things you can do uh, at any time that can help you feel better and strong in your mental health. There's no formula, there's no right way. You can participate in activities you enjoy that make you feel good, um, ones that make you feel that are, feel worth doing and are sustainable for you long-term. Um, be sure to focus on things that you can control. Um, remember the healthy sleeping, getting being physically active and eating well, connecting with your community, um, taking a walk, all suggestions of things you can do now. You can make plans, consider a new hobby, maybe schedule a trip with loved ones. Um, you could consider volunteering or um, reconnect with something that you're passionate about. And even if your um, health is not such that you can take a, a big trip, consider maybe celebrating a treatment milestone with some other kind of event. Or maybe it's a special meal out or a day visiting a town nearby. There, um, the process of planning can be just as exciting as the process of actually doing and is a real boost to our mental health. Physical activity is really anything that gets your body moving. You don't have to be this guy who looks like he's ready to run like a half marathon. Um, even if you just walk to the end of your driveway and back, that's some physical activity. Um, so try to be physically active a little bit every day. Uh, physical activity fuels energy and our mental wellness. The food you consume is an important source for providing your body with energy for your daily activities. So you might want to attend one of our Nutrition with Elena classes or Cooking with Chef Dave demonstrations. Um, your cancer center might have a dietitian that you can meet with. Um, and our Elena, who does our nutrition class, she actually accepts many different insurances and can meet with you privately. And it would be covered, it could be covered by your own insurance. And she's fantastic. I speak from experience. Uh, she has a lot of uh, oncology knowledge and would be, uh, is a great resource for us. Food is fuel for energy and our mental wellness. So integrative medicine are other ways to care for yourself that are not the usual therapeutic methods that are done. 
Um, and these are always meant to complement uh, the things that are medical treatments. And we know from studies that um, people who do complementary therapies like this have better outcomes. So where you go for cancer treatment might actually have some of these on site. We offer a lot of these kind of programs here because we know of the benefits of it. Um, and there may be other nonprofits locally that you can um, you can be referred out to uh, and, and again, receive some of these, like we offer our programs at no cost. There could be other um, avenues for receiving some of these at no cost or low cost as well. So there are things like acupuncture, which, can, which typically can be used to treat pain, yoga, meditation, or even Tai Chi. So this provides um, mindfulness activity as well as physical activity that um, can be great for and energizing for our mind as well as our body. Aromatherapy is the use of essential oils um, to improve our psychological well-being. It can sometimes reduce pain, provide relaxation, improve mood. Um, massage can some be a, sometimes be a great way to relieve pain or tension. Be sure to get it cleared with your doctor first and go to a, a, a massage therapist who is knowledgeable in working with an oncology patient. Um, I'll be honest, massage therapy is one of my favorite self-cares as well. Music therapy can be great. We um, have sound therapy classes here as well. It's very similar because music triggers parts of the brain that increases our mood and our overall quality of life. You can create your own musical therapy by turning on your favorite music. Maybe just turn it up, sing at the top of your voice when no one is around. Um, that can provide some uh, great lift of mood for you. Also, art therapy is um, can, is also a great integrative tool. We had a painting class here just a few hours ago, which was wonderful. Um, art therapy is a way we can use different, uh, we can learn different techniques. We can be in a social setting. Uh, it can encourage us to use self-expression in a different way that um, enables us to talk through our challenges or difficult emotions. So I did mention I was going to um, list some resources for you. So um, the, these will be provided for you um, afterwards in an email that you can print out. But there's lots, lots of national support resources um, uh, for caregivers as well as patients and on mental health and substance abuse services. So I wanna leave you today with three for the road um, that we covered a lot of information. So I hope you picked up something, but um, just, just kind of summarize it um, as into three points. The first one would be um, our mental health is as important as our physical health. Um, and so you need to address both in your life. And secondly, talk about it. Um, use the words we learned and um, talking about emotions to express how you're feeling uh, as, for your mental health and recognize how important talking about it and how um, healing that can be for you. And then third, you got this. You probably already do a lot of the things I mentioned um, as self-care items on that list, um, but you can try something new. Um, and maybe you can go back to something that's worked before that you kind of forgot that you had enjoyed, but you've got this. So as our final activity, I want you to think about, or if you still have that paper in front of you, write down, was there one thing that you might like to integrate into your daily life that we talked about today? Maybe it's moving more, um, thinking about that nutrition piece, um, maybe the sleep, maybe you need to talk to someone on your care team, whatever it is. So while you're thinking about that, I want to thank Merck and AstraZeneca for making this possible through a charitable grant. And thank you to you for listening. There's my contact information and our website as we are always um, available resources for you as well.